Welcome everyone to the Win Now podcast hosted by Deborah Bird, founder and CEO of Plug and Play SM. I am so excited for today's show, so let's go. And then myself, Todd Bookspan, founder of Win by Noon. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Win Now podcast. I am your host, Todd Bookspan, and I'm joined by my favorite co-host, Deborah Bird. What's up, Deborah? I think that's because I'm usually your only co-host. Does that make me your favorite or no? Well, I'll take the no, favorite. I'll just take it. Let's okay. just run with let's just run with that. If you guys yeah. don't know Deborah, she's the founder of Plug and Play SM, my world's favorite social media guru. And uh and super excited as always to have you here alongside of me. Yes, thank you. I'm as well. And uh, you know, I'm I'm fired up for this title. And, you know, naturally we we just got back from a mastermind where I got to personally meet Kyle face to face, which is rare in this digital world, especially with running social media. And, you know, he's a great guy, but super smart. I'm learning already and I'm I'm fired up for this call. So thank you. All right. You. So let me uh let me frame it and then I'll bring on Kyle and, and without much ado. So a lot of you know that I've been going down this wealth rabbit trail for a long time, but really got serious uh, about a year ago of really trying to dig in and figure out how to uh, uncover wealth. And along the way, I had met uh, Kyle Fuller. He is the owner of Factum Financial and really have um, really a lot of like philosophies. And then uh, actually dragged Kyle along first to be part of uh, the the Be Wealthy group that I'm part of, and now dragged Deborah along. That's where they both met. And so certainly, if anyone is interested in learning more about that, just uh, ring ring reach out to me on social. I'd be happy to uh, fill you in on that. But uh, without further now, I know who the real favorite is. He was first. He he was first. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize, but. That's a thing. Uh, I think what I would frame it up because you know most of who's watching or listening to this are going to be real estate agents and loan officers. And what I would tell you is that Kyle is alongside of us learning about what we love and what we do in real estate, but he's going to bring to it a whole different um, philosophy. And what I love is really Kyle's um, whole piece. Well, I shouldn't say piece. That's the wrong thing to say. Your philosophy, Kyle, you can, I'll let you lay it out right, but it's really around let's beat the banks. And so without further ado, welcome, Kyle. Thank you so much for being here. It's an absolute pleasure. I'm excited for this. You know, it's. Um, I, I think I'm equally, if not more, excited. I think Deborah's super geeked out too. Well, and I, I so I have a, a quick question because Todd, the way you just framed that with Kyle wanting to help you beat the banks, that sounds odd coming from a lender because you're in banking, you are a loan officer. So uh, is what that I would say is he's not talking about beat the mortgage banks. He's talking about beating the bank, like Bank of America, Chase Bank, um, and also doing some loan stuff. So why don't you real quick, Kyle, kind of explain who you are, what Factum Financial is, and then let's introduce this, this thing we call infinite banking. Love it. So let me, maybe I'll start off with a little bit of my background. So when I was 16 years old, uh, my dad encouraged me to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad from Robert Kiyosaki. And for anyone that has not read that book, you know, it's the number one best-selling finance book of all time. That should be in everyone's library that wants to build wealth. And when I read that book, I was a little bit disturbed uh, because I started to realize everything I was learning in high school at that time, none of it revolved around money. But that's a part of our lives that is really important. You know, like you, you need air every single day of your life. You also need money every single day of your life. I don't think anyone here has lived the day where they didn't need access to some type of money. And we were just never taught anything financial growing up. So that kind of started me on that trail. And so I was always very interested in money. And so in my early 20s, I knew I couldn't go to a, a typical college because they don't teach um, the level of uh, intricacy that I wanted to learn about money at a college level. And so what I did instead is I just took as many millionaires as I could um, to lunch. So if I would come across someone that I knew was wealthy, I'd ask them to go to lunch and I would ask them, what would you do if you were me? What do you wish you would have known? And I started to learn a lot of really interesting things. And then eventually it led me to an orthodontist who said, if you want to study money, why don't you just go study some of the best players in the money game, which are commercial banks. Okay. So if we have this hierarchy of money. Uh, if you look at Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant, you got employees and self-employed people on the left side, and you got business owners and investors on the right. 
And the business owners and the investors on the right, they usually pay the lowest amount of tax and they have the highest rates of return. It's better to play the money game on the right side of the equation. But what's really interesting is every single person, all three of us in this chat, everyone that's going to be on this call or listens to this, is one of three players in the money game. They're a consumer, a business owner, or an investor. So we're either on the left or right side of that quadrant. But there's another player in the money game. That player is the banker. It is Chase Bank. It is Wells Fargo. It is Bank of America, like, like Todd said. They're financing both transactions on either side of that of that uh, cash flow quadrant. Who we really should have been looking at is how do we also be the banker in that equation? You see consumers, business owners, and investors, they all need a place to save the money they're making. Where have we been conventionally taught to save? Chase Bank, B of A, Wells Fargo. So we save our money there and those banks turn around and they, they take that money and they lend it as fast as they can to borrowers who are other consumers, business owners, and investors. So if you kind of take a step back and look at that flow of money, the question we should be asking was, what if we also became the banker for our lives? So when, when Deborah was saying, you know, this is intriguing about beat the banks, we're not talking about beating the mortgage banks, right? We're talking about beating the banks at the game they're playing because the, when they assume that role, for each of us, most middle Americans, it's worth millions of dollars for you to own that function in your life. Money is going to transfer through your life. And banking is a conversation about controlling that flow of money. So when I was 24, I was given a book. Um, I might need to take this virtual background off real quick. I was given this book right here, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. And that 85 page book literally changed my life. You know, that, that book will now keep millions and millions of dollars within my family just by changing the way we think. And banking is a different mindset than a business owner, an investor, or a consumer. So that's a little bit of the background about where our, our mentality comes from, what we teach, why we teach it. And it is, I'll, I'll say this, Todd, it's a major paradigm shift for most people. Even business owners and investors, when they come into this, this is not your typical financial advice. It's very traditional, it's very old, but it is not typical, which is why you don't hear about it very often. Well, and, and I, I love it. And so I'll give you guys full disclosure. So I got first introduced to this concept in this book more than a decade ago before the financial crisis. And um, what I find found at that time, and you know, Kyle may or may not agree with this, but I found that not everyone who was in the space that he's in had their best intention of me as a consumer in mind. I found a lot of financial advisors were all about themselves and not about the consumer. Now, Kyle is 180 degrees that. Like I know now known Kyle for long enough to know he first and foremost cares about me because transparently I am a client of of his as well as uh, my family is as well. Um, and the people who originally built it for me didn't build it correctly. And so therefore it didn't work for me through the financial crisis. And so thankfully I re met Kyle and he re-educated me on, on what I already believed in, in a higher level. And so, um, first off, I love the background and, you know, I love what a student you are of it. And the fact that you found it at such a young age, I think is, um, is super unique. And then we've got some, we got some experts here, soon to be experts in our, that are throw, throwing some stuff in the chat. So we'll make sure we get to those questions, guys. I'll make sure I get those at Kyle. Um, you know, throwing at Kyle, but um, but I really love this whole idea. So one of the things, real quick, could you just tell us? You know, I was always amazed at how much life insurance these big banks actually have on their books. Yeah. So when you start studying wealthy players in the money game, um, one of the best things you can do is just watch what they're doing with their money, right? Like I, I feel like I've got pretty good common sense. So when I started studying wealthy individuals. You just want to look at how they're behaving. And this is one of the frustrating parts and kind of led us to our slogan of beat the banks is these big banks are encouraging Americans to save and save money in places they would never put money. And so um, dividend paying whole life insurance is the primary savings vehicle for most big major banks. And so right now, Bank of America has about $24 billion in cash inside their insurance policies. Now, notice I didn't say death benefit. I said cash inside their insurance policies. Now, these big banks, they consider this 
tier one capital. And tier one capital represents the bank's equity and reserves. So this is like their equivalent of a savings account. We all need a portion of our money in savings for emergencies and opportunities. And these big banks are very purposeful by not putting their savings with other banks, but they put it with life insurance companies because they get a tremendous amount of benefits by doing that. And so Wells Fargo has got about uh, 20 billion in cash value. Uh, Chase Bank's got about 12. City Bank's got about five. And so these big banks are also some of the largest purchasers of whole life insurance in the world. And so when you kind of take a step back and you look at that, they're encouraging us, keep all your savings at the bank. So it's liquid and it's safe. But if you stop and watch what they do, they would never do the things that they're telling us to do. And it's one of the, one of the things that just doesn't sit right with me. And so two of the biggest problems that fact them, and this is why we, we created the company that we're trying to address across America is that uh, the two biggest problems we see are Americans do not save enough money. And so we live in a culture where we spend everything that we generate. And so the average savings rate is less than 5% with Americans, even uh, high income earners. That, that's a serious problem because we never end up keeping anything for ourselves. And the second problem we see is that we as Americans keep the savings we do have in some of the most inefficient savings environments ever. And so this is a conversation now about banking, which is why my family, our business, we no longer, we still use banks, obviously, we keep a little bit of money there, but most of our savings we will divert over to an insurance policy because it's got a lot more benefit to it sitting there versus sitting in the bank. And not just from a savings ROI perspective, but also because of taxes, right? Is there... Yes, absolutely. So if do you want me to go into more of the, of, of the why that banks keep money there? Whatever direction you think we should go. One thing I want to throw out there too, because people are asking lots of questions um, about learning about this. So are you willing to share? I know you've done some courses on this. Um, are you willing to share? What's the best link for someone to go to to sign up for uh, you know, I know you call it the red pill. I think what's the what's the best place for people to get educated on what you're talking about? Yes, yeah, so we have years and years worth of education on this courses that we've built. All of it's free. We're an educational company before we're a financial company, um, and so we love to teach. And we only want to work with people who also want to improve their lives. And so that's what we have our education program first. We're not going to sell you anything. Um, but it's also why our renewal rates are on, our, on our policies are so high because our clients are so educated. And so, yeah, you want me to throw that link up there in the chat, Todd? That would be awesome. Okay. And, and I will say, because we, we recently had a Zoom call with Kyle after meeting him from the mastermind, which I highly recommend people check that out. Just being in that room, like Kyle said, it is for me, and I'm I'm someone who has studied this and I consume this content, but it was such a paradigm shift for me. I'm probably naturally a little skeptical where I'm I'm always trying to poke holes and things just to make sure it all pans out. But the Kyle's approach and the amount of education, like he said, that he has, where he has sent us our homework items that really help you get on the bus and learn at a pace that's easy to digest, where then you can go back and rewatch. It's almost required because it is sometimes like it feels like mental gymnastics for some. I know there's some on here who clearly have already kind of started down this journey, but I can't express enough how if you're truly interested in growing wealth quicker, faster, but with experts to help kind of guide you to make sure you get uh, Kyle's information so that you can learn and, and own the learning, because I think that's important. Yep, that's it. It's it's nothing more than an educational process. This is just this is information um, that banks do not want the middle class knowing, which is why a lot of us don't hear about it. Because as soon as you understand that you can abide by these banking principles for yourself, your family, or your business, you essentially eliminate that profit from these big banks because now you can keep it on your side of the equation. And the best part is you can do it inside a guaranteed asset um, that will give you a lot of control and a lot of certainty in your financial life, which is something that most people are not accustomed to. Most investors and, and people just starting out in the money game from, from my experience, 
are, are usually speculating when they think they're investing. So, which is why they consistently lose, right? And so the nice thing about banking is banking is a completely separate conversation than investing. Investing is a separation of your control uh, between you and your capital. So you send dollars out with the expectation that they come back with more dollars and banking is the exact opposite paradigm. Banking is about controlling all the dollars that flow through your life and harnessing them for their max potential every day now and in the future. And so it's a completely different paradigm, which is why we start with the education. Once it clicks for people, and I'll, I'll just tell you, if you, read, uh, if you read this book, Becoming Your Own Banker, the very first page will tell you this is a, a course for about 10 hours worth of education. And so, which is why we recorded our videos. Most people, five to eight, you know, eight to 10 hours of education into this, all the light bulbs go off and then they go, oh my gosh, I get this now, but it's a, it's a slow process. You just a little bit at a time, read a quick book, watch some videos. You're going to have questions, but everyone always asks the same questions, which is why we recorded our courses. And so would you recommend watching your videos first, reading the book first, do it simultaneous? Yeah, I would do those both at the same time. So that link I put in the chat, that's our introduction to infinite banking. Those are very particular videos that if you watch them in that order, this conversation we're having will, will make a lot of sense. And then I would go order that book um, from the Nelson Nash Institute and, and get a hold of that, that copy. And 85 pages long. I'm an average reader. It takes me like two and a half hours to read. Um, read it through and then let's have a conversation. Well, and I love that you say you're an avid reader. You have to understand that everyone in Kyle's organization, um, they, read, they read books every single month as a group. And then they read some books the same month, every single year. And so, you know, the fact that you're a, a lifelong learner, it's just kind of fun. Like this last event I was at, I had Kyle to my left, I had Deborah to my right. And it was just fun to watch the two of them take notes and see what they were taking that was the same as what I was thinking. And, and, and more importantly, what they were thinking that was different than what I was thinking. And so um, I just love uh, the brain trust. You know, you don't realize when I got Deborah and Kyle sitting here uh, on Zoom with me and then, or, you, you know, listening in is that that uh, they get a, a great brain trust here of, of uh, knowledge. Absolutely. And it, it's a part of the journey of life, right? So I've, I've read that book, Becoming Your Own Banker, at least 60 times in the last almost 10 years. And so the interesting part is as you grow and learn and develop and your financial IQ increases, you go back and you read a book that you've probably read before, but it has a whole different meaning to it because you're a completely different person at that time. So you're ready for a different message inside the same book. Mm -hmm. So we've got a few of those books in our company. The One Thing, The Compound Effect, and The Go-Giver are the three books that we start every January, February, and March with because the principles in there are timeless. And so you just grow and develop and you go back and read it a year later and you highlight a whole new set of pages and, and, and statements in there. And so the same thing will happen with that becoming your own banker book. The more you understand banking, you go back and read it and you'll find a nugget on a page you totally overlooked the first time. So after you read these books, say for the first time, um, what are the, like, what would you say the next steps are? Obviously you've just been exposed to a little bit of new information and new learning. So you're probably like myself right now, I, I can feel overwhelmed of, okay, what, what have I set up that I now need to go fix or kind of like unlearn, you know, so then you can relearn. What would you say are some of those, you know, critical components of here's what you then do next and start this process? Great question. So the way we teach this, it's like entirely backwards from most insurance sales programs. So most insurance agents would talk to you and they would say, how much death benefit do you need? Now we're talking about banking. And so it's actually a savings conversation. So everything that we start with is how much are you consistently saving right now? We're just going to change that from saving inside a commercial bank to saving inside your own business bank or family bank now. And so it starts with a savings conversation. And so you'll need to know how much you can comfortably and affordably save each month or each year, depending on what your situation looks like. And then we'll start to formulate a plan around that savings number. And we keep it very affordable, very comfortable up front, because like Todd said, one of the ways you can shoot yourself in the foot is starting too big, too quick. 
And this is a process that's meant to be in place for your whole life, which is why it's called whole life insurance, right? And so we can afford to take it a little bit slow and, and we'll build upon it as we increase our financial IQ, understand banking, increase cash flow. We can buy more policies in the future. And so that would be my recommendation is have a savings number ready to go when you're ready to start. And depending on how big or small that number is, you just start off with a little private banking system or a really big private banking system. And so, you know, nine years ago when I started this, we had a very small private banking system. It was like $8,000 a year that we were saving. And now our, our premiums or what we call deposits into our banking system now are much, much bigger than that. But we grew into that conversation. And so just know that it is a journey and you just need to have the right guide on that journey. Just like any other area of life, right? Having a good mentor will save you years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you know, I know the two of you are aware of this, but if you, you know, if you think it's expensive to work with a professional, what wait till you see what the amateur costs you, right? And so you want to find someone that really is passionate about this and lives and breathes what they're talking about. Well, and I think the, the key that you just said is Kyle just said is you can always add to it later. And so what happened to me was my, my minimum commitment was too much. It was based on, you know, me living it up in the, you know, the best financial times before the financial crisis and had the planner at that time built a, um, had Kyle's philosophy and said, Hey, let's just start here with something that's really comfortable. We can always get to where this bigger number later by adding policies in the future. You know, they kind of went for the grand slam from, you know, the policy perspective where, you know, Kyle's like, Hey, let's hit singles and doubles. And then we'll get you to the grand slam when it makes financial sense for you. Because I would have been, you know, I, I'm fortunate that I've had, you know, gotten to the point that I'm at, but I would have been in a whole lot better financial position had I met Kyle back then versus the, the way that I had gotten it going. And so that was really the, the key point that I want to make sure that you heard what Kyle said is he's not shooting for that now. So like right now I'm in the process of getting my daughter set up with Kyle to get policy set up because I'm trying to help them build a bank now when they're in their early 20s so that when they're my age, they're way further ahead than me and it's starting out small and they'll be able to add to it and do more over time because I trust Kyle and the advice that he's going to give, not just to me, but to them over time as we build out this big family banking complex. Complex, mm -hmm. I think that's the right word. Banking system, hey, there we go. I like complex. <laughs> well, so, I think just to keep it in perspective for, you know, in the loan officer or real estate agent language, it's no different than someone, if they were going to buy a home and instead of financing it on a 15 year term where your payment is more, like yes, you may get it paid off quicker, but your monthly commitment is going to be higher. And who knows, sometimes, you know, when you're buying a home, that strategy may have to pivot because life pivots. Maybe you have kids that you weren't expecting so soon, or you had to move or there's a death or whatever. But, you know, you if you set it, set it up on a 30 year note, that's a little bit more affordable of a commitment where they don't feel stuck, or if you wanted to pay more, you could, but at least that monthly obligation is more comfortable uh, for those who you know are financing. So that's how my mind kind of wraps around the key concept you just talked about with setting up that savings goal is make sure that it is meant for the whole life when there's multiple seasons in your life, guys. So you have to think about that. And it's also one of the reasons why you want to be really particular on where you're buying these policies and then how they're structured. So there's a few elements that go into that. And so I love what you said, Deborah. You know, take the 30 year note because if you wanted to pay it down in 15, you still have that option. But if something in your life changes and you're locked into a 15 year note, it's a little bit harder to negotiate that with the banks. But if you're in control of that equation, you know, you can always pay it down quicker, but at least you have that option. So we take the same approach with building these policies. And so we do get a lot of people coming to us saying, I have insurance, but I would say 95% of the time, it's not the right type of insurance. It's not built properly. And they were most likely sold a policy from an agent who they have no idea even exists. And so it's, it's an unfortunate statistic in our industry, something we're definitely wanting to change. The process of becoming your own banker is very involved. And so we have a lot of, we teach deep dive classes every single month with our, or with our company and our client base because it's an educational program. And so the way we design policies are very flexible. Now, certain carriers have different nuances that they're known for. And so you wanna find a carrier that fits your unique goals and strategies. 
Um, I'd be careful not just to run the numbers and find a carrier that has a, a really good looking piece of paper with a bunch of numbers on it, right? Because those, those can change, life changes. And so you want to make sure you can get a company that endorses what we teach, is mutually owned, been around over 100 years. So there is a criteria to this. And there's about 10 carriers in the US that we would recommend uh, for buying good, strong whole life insurance as your foundational asset to grow wealth. And so you want to be real particular. Um, and I've got a video recorded on the course because that's a question that gets off, asked often. And so we've got it, we've got it all there. Well, so what I would say, a lot of you um, who know me from the mortgage space, when I first got in the mortgage business, I worked with financial advisors. And because I had these policies in place, they wanted me to be the person who could tell their clients about taking out money and putting it into policies and doing a version of infinite banking. And what really um, discouraged me from staying involved and recommending them is what I would find is they would sit down and they would sell a client a policy that benefited them more, paid them a higher commission, didn't perform as well. And then I would see them get a different carrier and a different policy for themselves. So what I love about Kyle is, is the carriers that he recommends to his clients um, and the way he sets them up for his clients is the same carriers in the same way he sets them up for himself. And so again, it's this level of integrity that Kyle's not going to stand here and tell you he has, but I've known Kyle for a long time and I trust Kyle. And that's, that's the reason I've got him here teaching you all something that I'm a uh, big believer in and super passionate about. Um, Kyle, what, one of the questions that someone asked in the, in the chat here was they've got a policy. How do they know if it's a good policy? Is that something that, how, how would you, how would you tell them to, what, what would you tell them to do knowing that they have a policy and they're just not sure if it's the right policy? Um, and so if you've got an existing policy, wonderful. I think too many Americans are also underinsured when it comes to their financial situation. I think we see too many uh, GoFundMe pages for families who weren't even carrying term insurance. And so like, you know, term insurance cannot be used for what we teach with banking because it doesn't generate any type of cash inside the policy. And so whatever insurance you have, definitely keep it. Do not cancel it just because you listen to a one hour webinar with us. But if you want to send it to me or someone on my team, we will look at it for you. No cost. We do it all the time. Um, and let me and our team educate you on it. There's a good chance it can still be used, but you got to learn how to use it. And that's where our education piece comes in. And if we start working together and you learn enough on your own, you're going to be able to tell us, hey, I probably don't need this policy anymore. Or yes, we're going to, we're going to keep this one. But we want to teach, we always add to your system, not subtract. So I don't want to tell you like, oh, throw away your garbage insurance policy and come buy this awesome policy for me. Insurance across the board is good. We just need to look at it and see why did we purchase it? What is the intended use? And we'll help you make some decisions from there. But you can email it to me or someone on our team, and we'd be more than happy to look at it for you. We do it all the time. And I, I just want to be completely transparent. That, that, that was me. So I attend the mastermind and I'm listening to all this and I read a book and I'm like, I know I have several life insurance policies or I think I do. Like I have some for my kids. I remember setting a term life when I was younger. I believe I had a whole life, but I was like, Kyle, I don't even know. I don't really know what I have and I don't even know what the strategy is. And so he sent us an intake form and we were able to fill out the intake form. And then we jumped on a call and he just asked, you know, what, what are your goals? And for me, I don't want to just create wealth for, for me in the right now. Like I want to actually create generational wealth for my kids. And I didn't even know how I could, I don't want to say leverage my children, but I have four humans I'm responsible for that. I'm, I'm still, I look at them. I'm like, how did anyone trust me to be responsible of four humans? But you know, it, it can be kind of costly of when you're raising them and you want to be able to provide for them with everything that maybe you didn't have. But then there's this fear of uncertainty of like, I don't even know if what I'm doing is working or will it work? Like I, I wasn't sure. So I so appreciated Todd, you know, allowing me to meet Kyle. And I just felt I could trust him one to, to say, I, I have no clue what I'm doing. Here's all the stuff that I bought can you help me? And he, he does. And he sends you that form. And I just, I care about everyone who's tuning in right now. Don't be bashful. Don't be shy. There's no judgment, um, you know, and, and get the help by the people who want to help. And we'll do it from a pure motive and a heart of just wanting to make sure that 
you know, you and your family can succeed beyond just your time on earth. I love that, Deborah. And that's one of the reasons why we love the book, The Go-Giver. You know, it's just, it's the law of value. You, Whatever you do in life, you just bring more value to other people than you're ever going to get compensated for. And that's just the way you commit to, to living. And it's just a servant attitude. And it's it's big part of our community over here. And so, um, yeah, I, I really love that. And I wanted to touch on one thing that you, you had mentioned, because we did have a conversation about your kids and how to bring the family closer together through education around money, which is another big passion of mine. So money, would you to agree that is a pretty taboo subject in most households? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're almost taught that it's rude. Yeah. And right. You, like we learn from our parents. I mean, my, my parents are super smart people and they've done well financially, but um, they have opposing views of money. And yeah, this, they don't even talk about it now. Well, I think, you know, just from, you, know, you guys know how honest kids are. Like you, you go somewhere and they'll be like, gosh, this person's house is small. Like they must not have any money. And you're like cringing, like, oh my gosh, because you're not, it's rude to talk about money. You're, you, you actually like avoid the conversation usually. So yes, I would agree with you. Yeah. It's a, uh... It's something that we're, we're trying to change. And so we have a, you know, like I said, I've been doing this almost 10 years now. So we have a, a little bit of time under our belts and we have a pretty large family banking system and money has brought our family together. It's brought us closer together. And so one of my favorite authors is Stephen Covey. And he talks about being, you know, dependent, independent and interdependent. Well, we teach that with our family banking classes to our clients. You see, what essentially has happened with our kids is they're growing up, Deborah, we got young kids, and they depend on us for everything. Todd knows this too. He's got three girls. And at a certain point, they get to a stage where they grow up, and then they become independent. Well, when that happens, they leave the, the big bird family, and they go start the little bird family, right? But then what do they do with all of their financing needs? They go to a bank and they finance their own vehicles, their own mortgages, all the things that they need. But this is a proud moment in our culture. It's like we're independent from mom and dad. And in my studies, watching very wealthy families like the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds, these are big banking families. And they do things very backwards to the way middle Americans would raise and educate their family members. And so when that happens, the, the big banks have essentially divided and conquered us. But if you start to build a family banking system, your kids will actually come to you in time of need. And they'd say, mom, dad, I need a vehicle. Well, are you going to let them finance it through Chase Bank and let them have all that interest? Or do you want to build a partnership and a relationship with your child that's built on trust, uh, accountability? And we're not talking handshake deals here, okay? So Education has to be there. So do not loan money to family members without education or a contract. That's a big no-no. I mean, that, that like paper IOU, like, you know, Dumb and Dumber, when he has all those IOUs, he's like, here's 135,000. I want to hang for that one. Yeah, that one. No, uh, exactly. Dumb and Dumber. I love it. Yeah. Do not do the IO, IOUs, handshake deals. These are contracts you've got to set up after the education's happened. And so we should be looking at all of our children as cash flow sources because they're going to need financing. And if you get ahead of that by building a family bank, your kids can tie into that system when they need financing. You know, all of our boys are, are heavily insured. They've got big policies of their own. So when they need braces, vehicles, mortgages, college, whatever it is, they're going to come borrow from the family bank and they will pay it back with interest. Now, the cool part is when my wife, Diane, and I are no longer here, guess who gets all of those payments back plus more on a tax-free basis? Our kids. Wow. So imagine making a deal with a bank, Chase Bank, go in there and saying, I'll pay you 6% on these, on these car loans for you know, 40 years, however long I'm going to be driving, but I want all the money back as soon as this a certain time period hits, right? They're never going to make you that deal, but you can do this type of things within your family. And, you know, this is one of the problems that Nelson identified in his book. If you, now, if you can understand this problem right here, this entire concept will make sense. He said that you finance everything in life. You either borrow money and you pay someone else interest or 
you save up and use your own money and give up the interest you could have earned. That's what we call an interest cost. Okay, so what most Americans are doing right now is they'll borrow from a financial institution like a bank and they'll pay them interest payments. Now, we don't like that because it's money leaving our, our pool, right? And so what do we do? We get smart and we pay cash. And I was the pay cash person prior to learning these concepts. And why did I pay cash? Todd said it earlier. We learn our money habits from our parents. My dad taught me to pay cash because his dad taught him to pay cash. But the problem is we've always been a middle-class family. So maybe our thinking needs to change. And so once I realized if I paid cash for a vehicle, I just gave up the ability to earn interest on that money, not for five years, every day for the rest of my life. That's what we call an interest cost. That is a huge number that we're never taught to, to analyze conceptually or financially. And so this is one of the first videos you'll see on that intro content is how to calculate that for your life. And we'll, we'll teach it with something like vehicles. So all of us have been driving vehicles right now, but the problem is someone else is ending up with all the money. Okay, so it's not an investing conversation. This is a banking conversation. And I'll tell you, the average American will drive 13 vehicles in their lifetime and spend roughly $400,000 doing it. And whether they pay cash or finance it using a bank, they will have $0 to show for at the end of their life. Now, if you build a private banking system and change where you save your money, one of the benefits of saving with whole life is that you get a much higher interest rate on your savings than what a bank's gonna pay you. It's also much more private, protected, it's just as liquid, and it will grow tax, technically tax deferred, but we're gonna show you how to use it so it's always tax free. If you run the same $400,000 through a whole life policy and, and finance those same 13 vehicles, you'll have about one and a half million dollars at the end of your lifetime. That's a pretty significant difference from what most people are doing. Now, take that one and a half million dollars, times it by however many kids you have. So Deborah, you got four kids? Mm -hmm. Six million dollars in interest cost is leaving your family over one generation. Wow. So when we're talking retirement, cash flow, this isn't investing. This is going to happen 100%. And it's either you take advantage of it, you get ahead of it, and you build relationships with your kids so that they understand money at a better level, they tie into it. That's all potential cash flow that can be used for you now and in the future. And the best part is, is when you're gone, part of your legacy, because we've talked about multi-generational wealth, you will leave them, reimburse them essentially through your death benefit, everything they paid into that system plus millions more. If I was a kid, I'd be signing that contract all day long. Who wants well, to it's so funny because you usually think of your kids, maybe I'm the only one, as like money pits. Like I currently have my kitchen under renovation because my son forgot that he started a bath and left his water on all night if he went to bed. And I'm looking around like, I can't even file an insurance claim because we've had so many other claims of like them flushing Legos down a toilet and flooding. And so your mindset is like, gosh, you know, they can be such a money pit. But then seeing how you just said how they can be cash flow sources, I'm like, hmm, interesting. Like it's just a whole, that's what I mean by that like paradigm shift of, okay, well, maybe they don't have to be money pits, you know? So, it, I mean, this is, this is great. Thank you. Mm hmm and it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's going to happen, right? Like this is not an if, this is a when. Your kids will need financing one way or another. And I'll tell you, the big banks, they look at our children as cash flow sources. The, the difference is they don't give you any of the benefits when you keep your money there. They'll give you like a, a sucker and maybe a nickel once a year, even if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars at the bank. And so this just goes back to beat the banks, right? We're going to show you how to do what they're doing so you can play that same game inside your business or with your family. Which just doesn't mean you have a brick and mortar bank. It's actually a way better bank because there's no cost of acquisition. Mm. You don't have to get a bank charter, spend 10 years, have all the connections in the world. You can just go save your money where the bank saved theirs and start immediately with no overhead. It's the best business ever to be in. Well, and I think that's where I got robbed of personally is that, you know, whatever it was 12, 14 years ago, 
if the if the person I had sat down with who sold me a policy, right? They didn't educate me. They didn't bring me into the fold like like Kyle's talking about. If they would have showed me that it would be something that would be helpful for me as a parent to help my children better understand money, then I would feel better about the financial education that I've given my children. And so walk me through. So again, I've always felt really good because my dad told me to pay cash for cars. So instead, all you're doing is you're taking your money and that money that you would have paid cash for a car is money that you're putting into your policy. And then you are basically loaning it to yourself to buy the vehicle. And so you're still, your policy still earning interest on it. And then you're borrowing it out and then paying it back to your own policy, creating an arbitrage. Is that a correct statement or would you sharpen that a little bit? Yes, you're 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 pretty much right there, Todd. I just want to critique a couple things. So, uh, essentially, what's happening is you're becoming two players in the money game. Okay, so I, I have consumer Kyle and I've got banker Kyle. So I'm never borrowing from myself. Okay, so when we save money into a whole life insurance policy, that's our new savings account, our new private banking system. Um, when consumer Kyle needs to finance something. I borrow against that cash value. So it's a very big distinction. You never borrow from yourself. You're borrowing against the cash value. So let's say I've got $100,000 inside my policies right now. And that's earning an interest rate much higher than any bank's going to pay you from a savings vehicle. Okay, It's not an investment. It's a savings vehicle. So I'm going to borrow against that so that I never interrupt the compounding growth of that money. Okay, this is a really big rule of the money game you want to learn. Never interrupt the compounding growth of your money. And so now I go use that money to finance a vehicle. Now, consumer Kyle is going to pay back banker Kyle with some interest because that's what I'd normally do in the real world. So it's going back, yes, to the insurance company and policy that I own, but those are two separate things. So sometimes we hear that, why would you pay yourself interest, right? You're not paying yourself interest, you're paying another company that you own interest. You just happen to own both the companies. You see what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a two players in the money game. Now, the other part, the positive arbitrage. I wanna be careful that we don't uh, mislead anyone because there are a lot of marketing companies out there that get a hold of IVC, and then all they do is preach positive arbitrage. Now, positive arbitrage does not exist inside the insurance policies because what's happening here is you're earning a certain interest rate with your policy, which the insurance company is paying you, and they will let you borrow from their general portfolio against your cash value. Now, that number has to be higher than what they're paying on their, their accounts. Otherwise, they'd go under, right? No business could pay their depositors more than what they're loaning out. They would, they would go under. And so... The positive arbitrage, you could say, is happening when you have so much in cash value and you're not max leveraging it, right? So if I'm earning interest on 100,000 and I borrow 10,000 for a loan, the loan interest rate is higher than what I'm earning on the policy. It's just on a smaller amount of money. So it's that volume of interest conversation. And as you, as you repeat that process, it allows your cash to grow uninterrupted year over year over year. But if you fund a policy, and borrow out, borrow against all the money, uh, and just do that year over year. You would eventually lapse that policy because it can't keep up with that. So this goes all back into our education. The rules, there are rules to this, and you want to become what we call an honest banker. And so we'll help coach you and direct you on all of those transactions. Once you've three to five years of working with us, you're going to know this inside and out. Okay. Um, just as good as I'm teaching here. It's a really simple process. Everyone's already doing it. We've just never had the right savings vehicle to make it effective. So if I had to wrap my brain around this, I'm a little bit slower learner than Todd. Is this kind of the same as like a HELOC on your home where you have a home, you have equity and you can borrow from the equity and you pay an interest on that? which is technically coming from your payments that you've been making to pay down the principal. Is that Am I understanding that correctly? You are, to... you are spot on. Now, imagine getting a HELOC when huh? you controlled the amortization schedule. It's completely private and nobody knows you have this loan. You can pay it back on whatever terms that you want. It's going to grow completely tax deferred and it's you're earning interest on that HELOC every single day for the rest of your life. Right. You're not so paying it doesn't have, 
So it's not included in your DTI then when you're qualifying, right? Is that right, Todd? Did that show? It, it wouldn't show anywhere. And what I would say is this, and Kyle, you can, again, you can kind of give a little more information on it. It's you you just call up the insurance company when you want the money. You're not applying for a loan and waiting 30 days. You're calling up the insurance company, getting a check within a couple of days. That's the one good thing I did do with my policy was I bought an investment property. I got an 80% mortgage and I took the 20% down payment out of my policy. And I called up and I had a check before closing and it went terrific. Um, and so that was the one great thing that I did. I used it to actually buy real estate. And guess what? I own that house still and I bought it for this much. And guess what? It went down to be worth this much. And now it's worth this much because I bought it before the financial crisis. I wrote it down and I I, and I was able to, you know, now own the home still and then have it be worth, you know, a lot more. I think more than double what I paid for it. Okay. So my mind just, so for first time home buyers who may have insurance policies that their parents took out for them, could they technically borrow if it has cash value? Obviously it can't be term life, but they could technically borrow from that policy for their down payment, Right. Absolutely. That's what I did. But how many loan officers don't even check to see, like, I know there's a spot on the 10034, do you have life insurance? But I don't know of a whole lot that even asked that question or maybe know about this, where that could be a great source. But you have even to remind the- them they have to pay it back then too, right? I yeah, mean, I think that's right. a piece of it. And I, and I think so, you know, I mean, I, I love the conversation and where it's going. And I think, you know, one of the things to revisit, because I'm seeing some questions on it, is that there's a big difference between when um, someone when Kyle builds a policy for someone in your average insurance agent, right? The average insurance agent is like the average mortgage loan officer and the average realtor. They sell somebody something and they never talk to him again, right? They made their, they made their commission. They're like, Hey, good luck. And they never talked to him. So keep in mind that the difference there is that Kyle and his, in his organization continue to stay in touch and educate their clients. That's why everyone in our businesses all want to have a repeat and referral business. Guess what? That's what Kyle has built, right? His his business comes from referrals from his past clients. And then number two is, is that the policy is built a certain way and we kind of hinted at it, right? Kyle's not building it so that it's got this huge amount that you have to put in every year that's above what you could do. He's building it in a way that is ideal for this banking policy so that you have this flexibility. So like he just recently built a policy for my wife where we put a amount of money and transparently it's a fairly large amount of money that we we're going to we committed that we'll put in every year but it's not so much money that if we have a bad year financially we can't hit it but if we have a great year we can actually put more cash into it and have it perform even better. So he's built it with that flexibility he talked about. So um I think that your car example was great. I think you took Deborah and I by asking you, see, now if we would have had Kyle come on and we would just let him talk and, and Deborah and I didn't ask him questions, he would have gotten to his car story faster and done these other things. And so first off, Kyle, correct me if anything I just said was wrong. And then secondarily, what else was it that you want to make sure that we talk about while while we're still here live? And we know where everyone's going to go and they're going to um, check out the link that we put in um, and inv- listen into this in the podcast. It'll be in the show notes so that you can, you can get into Kyle's um, course for free. Um, but what what else do we want to make sure that we talk about? I would just say I'm going to I'm going to go back to what we call the problem and that's the the main point that this process addresses which is that you're financing everything in life that would be the main purpose that I'd want everyone listening to this to really come away with whether you borrow money from a another financial institution you're paying them interest payments or if you save up and use your own cash you are giving up the interest cost this problem allows you to keep that interest cost on your side of the equation, your asset sheet, your balance every day for the rest of your life in a guaranteed environment. This creates such a powerful financial, what we call tailwind, that will help push you along faster than you could ever imagine once you own this banking function. And so I would just say that if you can understand that piece right there, which is one of the first videos you're gonna see on our intro content, it's like a five or six minute video going into that concept a little more in depth, this entire process will make sense. Um, The other thing I would add is, if you look at whole life insurance as an investment, you'll never end up buying it, okay? Banks do not put so much money in insurance because it's an investment. They put it there because it's the world's greatest savings account that the middle class was never taught to look at. Okay, so mm-hmm. it is a savings vehicle. As soon as that mindset shift happens, you will be absolutely blown away at how valuable this asset is for you. 
And then from there, it's just a matter of getting some more education and, and working with a professional that'll help you build out the plan that's unique to you. So I would just add into be cautious of working with individuals that give you a strategy before they ever ask what your goals are. That's when you know you're dealing with a salesman, right? You need one of these policies, but I don't even know what you want to do with them, Deborah. So, but here's what's going to solve all your problems, right? No, we got to figure out what are your goals? What do you want to do? And then we could offer some potential strategies. Which I'm just going to tell you, I immediately after spending some time with Kyle, I'm like, all right, one, can I transfer my policies to you? Like, how do I have you audit what I have, create a strategy for me, but then take over all of this? That way we can have a, a true relationship where someone who already knows where I want to go and knows and thinks like this, because I think you're right. There's a lot of people out there who don't get the same kind of education, just like real estate agents and loan officers were not all created equally with you know our education. So if you're out there and you're thinking, okay, is it too late or how do I know which policies I have? You can be like Deb and be like, here, Kyle, just take it all. And how do I convert it? And shop it for me. And then like, where do I write the check? Because it's worth it um, to know that you're going to get exponential growth and have less interest costs um, where you're losing out on opportunity simply by just not knowing what the real problem is under the problem. And that's what I like that Kyle showed for us is we think there's the problem. I think that's like most clients, but they don't see there's actually a problem under the problem that we've got to like dig up so that people can then realize, oh, okay, I, I actually have a bigger problem than I even realized. Well said, Deborah. That's exactly it. There's the, that invisible problem that most people are not seeing. And this process will address that for them. And once it's addressed, you'll, you'll be so excited about how fast you can build and scale your wealth with so much control and so much certainty which is one of the best parts about what we do because we're dealing with one of the only, the only guaranteed asset that exists. We never have clients that lose money with their insurance policies. So I, I love what I do because our clients get wealthier every single year. And so it uh, just fuels our passion for what we teach. And uh, it's, uh, as you can probably tell, like we love what we do. Like retirement's not a word that I use. There's no plans for retiring. So I've got another 70 years in this business, which means I'll be around for Todd and his wife, you, your kids, and their kids. Mm -hmm. You see, this is a multi-generational play. This is why you need multi-generational relationships with companies that also think very long-term because it, it's going to, would we say that our country is in kind of a, a rough spot? I mean, like- A shithole? We didn't get to this point in 10, in 10 years, right? Like it's going to take a little bit of time to change the thinking, the habits of, of middle America. So someone's got to commit to a long-term play and that's really what we're about. Well, so, so here's kind of how, you know, let me, let me put my bow on it and I'll let Kyle and Deborah each put theirs on there. So, you know, number one is most of who's listening to this are in the real estate and mortgage space. And so number one is that when you think of, you know, you 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 think of who are the people in in our industries, um, and it could be you, um, who who are the people that you're really trying to replicate a practice like they have, and that's the practice that Kyle has in the insurance and infant banking space, right? I mean, he really is, um, you know, the the top one percent, or probably top, you know, one one tenth of one percent. I mean, what he does is what we all want to do, and really, what you have to think about is if you're trying to give your clients the best advice in real estate and mortgage, you know, what are the other things that you can do to help them? Um, be your successful, financially successful clients down the road. And this is just that pillar that they're probably missing. And so first you need to educate yourself on it. And Kyle's um, shared with you his resources and, and told you some others that you can do. So I would encourage you to educate yourselves. And I would be thinking really from a bigger perspective, how can you then not only build this into your life and your family's life, but how then can you pour this into those around you? And that's what I would encourage you all to do. Well, and you guys know, for me, I'm going to always tie in how you make this in your social media strategy. And to me, everything that we do is what what are you learning each day that with what you learn, you could then go serve more because that's the goal. And so just taking these courses and learning from Kyle, imagine the impact, not only that it's going to have on you and your family, which is great, but it's also the domino impact that if we stop being the secret LOs of the world or secret 
real estate agents and share this truth. And, and it may need to be just, you know, micro nuggets to at least pique curiosity. Because if we leave it to our traditional education system, which I was a former teacher, so I've seen and written that curriculum, it's that's not going to do it. You know, we're going to have to use our voice and look at it as a sense of we're just sharing truth. People can choose to accept it or not. It's no, you know, I'm not going to be offended. I'm, I'm going to keep sharing what I believe to be the financial truths that this country needs. And so use this bit of information. Take one nugget and share it on social so that it can impact even if it's just one person that hears it. Maybe tag Kyle, let people know where they could also find Kyle's information and um, you know, make sure you're following him too. I love it. And I would just add to that, you know, the problem that Factum is like addressing for middle Americans is we're, we're changing their savings environment to add way more benefit to their family or their business. But conversation two is we're incredibly cash flow minded, right? Winning the money game, the number one rule to winning the money game is to create cash flow. It's exactly backwards to the way banks and Wall Street have taught us about accumulation. And so we are very cash flow minded, which is why conversation two for us heavily revolves around real estate investing, right? Assets that appreciate in value, lower taxes, create cash flow. And so we have so many strong real estate partnerships. I know you two are, are heavily in that realm with great real estate partners. Let's collaborate. We've got too much competition in this world and not enough collaboration. We need to be working with each other to add value to each other's databases, which is why, you know, Todd teaches, he coaches to our entire Factum team on efficiency, business strategies, leadership. And um, he's not a life insurance agent but he's a phenomenal human being with a high level of success. And so we've collaborated on how we can bring value to each other's databases. And so let's talk about how we can sync up and do a seminar or, or something to add these conversations, just like you said, Deborah, that it, if we don't share our light, we, we never, you know, people don't get to see it. And if you have this amazing knowledge of real estate investing or how to structure loans properly to help more people, but you're hiding that light, no one ever gets to see it. We've got to open it up a little bit and let people know what's happening. All right. So time out. So you just, are you offering to the people who are listening to this, if they want to actually have you help them teach a seminar to their, their clients and friends that you're willing to do that? That's all we do, Todd. Okay. Sound like that could be more real estate transactions for everyone listening to. Well, since that's I think you're just helping people. I mean, that's the bottom line. You're helping solve a challenge that we all have. And so I am super grateful that Kyle, you're willing to take the time. I would encourage you all to watch um, Kyle's videos because transparently, I think that Deborah and I didn't do you all service with all of our questions. We were just so excited to uh, bring Kyle into our community that we're super passionate about helping all of you. And I know that if you had Kyle... Uh, walking through uninterrupted uh, that with all of his uh, short bite-sized videos that you can watch that you're going to get even more than you've already gotten since you've listened this far. Couldn't agree more. All right. So on behalf of myself, Deborah, the whole team here at the Win Now Podcast, and now Kyle Fuller of Factum Financial, thank you all for being here. Anything like you want to add, Kyle, before I kick you off? I just appreciate you two so much. You know, hanging out with you guys for a couple of days in Nashville was just awesome. And so just good people getting together to, to team up. And, you know, one thing I say, one plus one is 11. It's not two. So when you collaborate with the right people, you can have exponential amount of value created for other people. And so that's what I feel like is happening here. And I just want to thank you two for taking the time to put me on here. I'm extremely honored. It was tons of fun. I really appreciate it. All right. That is awesome. Thank you, sir, for being here. Two last things I'll say. Number one is if you want to learn about hanging out with me, Kyle, and Deborah at the next uh, Be Wealthy event, just go to my toddbookspan.me. There's a thing on there that says uh, Be Wealthy, and I'd be happy to uh, jump on a call with you and help you understand more about what that event is all about. There's one coming up in May. Um, and then secondarily, if you enjoyed this, um, and wherever you're watching, if you're watching on YouTube, if you would subscribe and give us a a like, that would be great. If you're watching this in one of the podcast formats, a, a, a subscription there and a review, five-star review would be awesome as well. Thank you so much. We will see you all next week um, on our next episode. Thank you.